Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Alliance of Independent Authors Advanced Self-Publishing Salon with me, Joanna Penn and Orna Ross. Hi, Orna. Hi, Joanna, and hello, everybody. Yes, here we are. And this was going to be the new year, but we're kind of still still in January. So as we record this, so officially, it's still kind of the beginning of 2023. And that's what we're talking about in today's session. We're doing opportunities for indie authors in 2023. So we'll get into that in a minute. But before we do, we'll do our update. So Orna, what's going on with Ally? Ally starts the new year always with a woo, and uh, this year has been no exception. We've got lots of, of things going on because uh, the reason it, it's always busy is because I think everybody, indie authors, use the new year as a way to recharge and set new plans and all that kind of thing. We are getting lots and lots of Amazon and Ingram queries, and I just wanted to, to mention that today and just ask members, this is addressed to members in particular, please use the Amazon and Ingram support desk first of all. We're totally there and uh, happy to help and be a bridge between ourselves and all our partner members. But the first port of call has to be the actual support desk themselves. And very often that will clear your problem. Uh, you just need to be a little bit patient because they too are quite busy at this time of year. Um, yes, yeah, so we have produced two new um, booklets, I suppose you would call them, that I want to draw attention to. Melissa Addy in our campaigns um, desk now is doing lots and lots of things and she has put together a very short guide to self-publishing for free and uh, 15 or 16 points where a free or almost free little tiny sheets on one or two of them but really um, a very useful guide for those of you whose budgets might be feeling a little bit stretched at this time of the year and that's probably a lot of us and um, also a guide, um, guidelines to author safety that came up last year um, with the whole Sam and Rushdie thing. And um, one of our members did a, a very interesting sort of review and survey of the author community and found that a lot of authors had, had actually suffered a lot of safety issues. So we put together a small guide on that and they are available as usual in the member zone. Just go to publications, log in first and um, navigate to publications and then you'll find them there. And also the new directory is out. So yeah, lots, lots to read and catch up on in January. Yeah, that's good. And uh, yeah, I feel there's so much. I mean, I've just written down that free guide because, you know, I still use free. Absolutely. You know, I, yes, I use paid, but I still like free. Uh, and we all use different kinds of advertising and we reach different people. And, you know, I'm always a book bub, for example, always talk about how free books, people who buy, who download free books, a certain number go on and buy other books. And it is a way of discovery. So oh, we've been using that for more than a decade and it still hasn't gone away. So absolutely. Uh, all good. I'm really, I'm really glad you raised that because obviously I have confused people. This guide isn't a guide to um, use of free or freemium in self-publishing. It is a guide to actually producing and promoting your book for for free or as close to free as possible. So, in other words, using services and, ah, okay. and friends and family and beta readers and, and so on. So, yeah, I'm glad I confused you because I probably confused loads of other people too. So, it's actually a guide to self publishing for very low cost. And obviously you're cutting corners if you do that a little bit and, you know, the ideal is to hire, you know, free editors if you can afford it and so on. But this is a guide for those who haven't got money and who are maybe starting off and haven't got anything to invest. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a guide particularly for those who are, who are starting out. Oh, yeah. Okay, right. So frugal, we'll say fr frugal. <laughs> no, that's great. <laughs> Yeah, fantastic. Well, um, talking of not frugal, mm -hmm. I... <laughs> frugal, you've got exciting news, share. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I am, I am going to product placement, oh, wrong way around, uh, my pilgrimage book, um, which is a solo walking travel memoir, midlife uh, book, it's very different to my normal books, my Kickstarter, as we record this 31st of January 2023, it's it's got about five days left, I'm really happy with the response, It's it's far exceeded 
my expectations like far far exceeded i th this falls down between all the cracks in my current author platforms i've you know new genre new platform new format hardback with uh, images so yeah and i was really worried and in fact kickstarter is really weird because it has a, bu a button that says launch and when i was about to press it i like my heart was hammering out my chest it, which it hasn't done for many years as a with publishing I still get that when I speak and things like that but in terms of that that chest banging I was so nervous and worried and anxious and it's worked out well so in terms of fear of failure fear of judgment fear of everything um falling flat on my face looking like an idiot uh hopefully that that's not happened uh if people really? are interested tell people uh, how well you've done I mean you set you set your goal up so my goal was, yeah, my goal was at one thousand pounds. So I guess around twelve hundred US dollars, because yeah, I really didn't know what I would get. And at the moment, it's at eighteen thousand pounds, which is I guess around twenty twenty one thousand US dollars. So it's done very well. And as you know, and we're going to do a special show on crowdfunding in a couple of months because you've done this too. But essentially, it's a way of getting um, reaching readers direct. It's a way of getting a chunk of money up front in order to print things. And essentially, it's like a, a mini. It was not an advance because the book is done, but it's essentially a, a big chunk of money up front. And then, of course, you can still publish everywhere else. And I will publish everywhere else in a few months time, like by May. Um, so yeah, it's going really well. Uh, so that's my big thing that's going on. But also I've just put a pre-order up on a short story. So writing some fiction. Uh, and Foster, Sorry, just before you leave the crowdfunder, tell people where they can, because it's still open for another few days, right? Yes, it is. So um, it's still at jfpen.com forward slash pilgrimage. And uh, I will that will redirect after the Kickstarter is finished. Um, so jfpen.com forward slash pilgrimage um, in order to have a look at, at that. Um, in terms of the short story, I'm doing a lot with AI. And again, we're going to talk a bit about this, but I've got um, book cover design, um, all kinds of elements of writing. So generative AI, this, and I'm be doing a lot on what all the tools I'm using to do that. But um, yeah, and then I'm off to the US to speak at a conference. So I, I feel like the years, like the gates have opened and I'm like running at full tilt. <laughs> yeah. So how about you? <laughs> Yeah, quiet. Thankfully, uh, I think we go through these cycles, don't we? When we're busy, 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 and we're we're so, um, and then not so busy. So yeah, while Ally is busy, I'm keeping my head down at the moment, uh, just doing my usual monthly. I will start the speaking thing, but not until April this year. Um, got a poetry book coming for Valentine's Day and uh, doing some special signed hardback. So if you've got a loved one and you'd like um, you'd like to give them a nice uh, dead, signed and dedicated hardback gift copy of poetry, then you can uh, email me about that, info at ownerrock.com. Um, but my big thing that I've been working on in terms of, uh, aside from writing, is moving my patrons over to my website, my reader patrons. So I'm really happy about that now. Um, not all set up and kind of ready to go. Um, with, and it was quite a job. They were on Patreon. I had kind of author patrons and reader patrons, and it was all very kind of mixed up. So now that's segmented and the reader patrons um, are all going through service through the website now so um yeah phew done uh, and looking forward to that so yeah yeah, so busy start. And it's always good to remember, like we are all in the organization of the Alliance of Independent Authors, but we also have our individual author careers as well. And so, and of course, we have our different brands, both Orna and I have fiction and nonfiction, and many people do in the community. Uh, and so, yeah, there's always things to be done on all this stuff. But equally, we should just say that we were going to do this last month but we were both kind of burned out so we moved it to the end of the month and that's also important is to remember to take time out and uh, rest if you need to so I feel like that was needed but, and now I'm going at, at full tilt but um, anything else or should we get into the topic? Let's get into the topic because there are so many opportunities and we only have 
half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's get into the topic, opportunities and trends for indie authors in 2023. So number one, we have gone with the rise and rise of the creator economy. So this is essentially where consumers and readers and listeners uh, fund the work of creatives. And of course, as authors, it is very exciting. So Orna, why are you so excited about this? It's growing like crazy, um, the creator economy. So, I mean, I started to get interested in this about two years ago when I was doing the self-publishing 3.0 guide. You could see that Web 3.0 was having a, a change in publishing, a sort of a corresponding change. And that whole thing of authors selling direct and authors going directly to their readers became very interesting to me. And watching some members who were doing some interesting and unusual things that weren't all that visible. So we were kind of calling it the dark indie economy. And then since then, it has just been growing exponentially in the real sense of that word, where it's just going faster and faster and faster all the time. So last year, just to give people an idea, now this is a whole creator economy, which includes everything, video, audio, text. Uh, books, short writing on Substack and places like that. Um, in July 2022, it was estimated to be worth more than $100 billion. And yeah, what does that mean? We don't know how much publishing is in there. We do know that authors have been very slow to take advantage of this, which means that this is a huge opportunity because that $100 billion in July was up from just $20 billion six months before that. That would give you an idea of the fact that so many buyers are now willing and happy and delighted to buy from um, the creator directly, but also that the big um, social media platforms and then other creator economy platforms set up specifically to be that bridge in between the, the creation because they were coming in very, very quickly to take advantage of that and that's what's helping it to grow. So that's why I'm so excited about it, really. To me, it is true independence, where you are really, you know, there's no middle person. It's you directly engaging with the reader. It really forces you to think about what your value offering is. I think that's one of the things that's so great about it. And it puts you in these scary situations like you were in there with your crowdfunder, where you you know, you have to put yourself out there in a whole new way. And I think when you're getting that little scared feelings as a sign that you really are being creative and you really are stretching yourself and expanding, which is what being creative is all about. Mm. So to give people some more examples, because, of course, you said that there's no third parties, but there are third parties. Like we mentioned Kickstarter, Patreon, Substack, for example, you know, WooCommerce. So we are using technical tools and, you know, some of them have fees like Kickstarter is five uh, percent or um, fees to pay per month. But that's different to a publishing platform that takes a bigger chunk is that that's what you mean isn't it we're still using technical tools it's just different to a publishing platform yes so we're talking about digital we're talking about digital books and we're talking about technical tools but when i when i spoke there about going direct that i'm talking about there are more direct platforms within this so you've got a situation so for example and um, shopify is some is a much more direct engagement than amazon say hmm. as a as a comparison and um woocommerce which is what i use on my own website now i was talking about moving my patron my reader patrons to my own website and um, i'm using woocommerce so there is a transaction fee and there is nothing else there's just me you know whatever i decide to to, to give them and a transaction fee on each thing so then you've got other platforms that we'll talk about those now that are coming in to facilitate things, make it easier for us as creators and make it easier for people to buy. And also, you know, there is an argument that people, uh, the buyer, trust something like Shopify, say, more than orneros.com. Um, I think it's an argument that will have hold less and less water as, the, as time goes on. And it depends on us as well, how we decide to, to take advantage of this big opportunity, how, we, how we're going to actually construct it for ourselves. So 
I've gone for the absolute most India of India options on this, but there are lots of ways that you can do it. And as ever, authors will do it in all sorts of ways and in the way that best suits themselves. And that is the thing to do. Mm. Yes, yeah, so I use uh, Shopify. I've got my Shopify store, creativepenbooks.com. Uh, and when we talk about, um, you know, the, the the connection, it's also that we get the email address of the buyer. So, of course, if someone buys your book on Amazon or Kobo or Apple or Ingram or, or whatever, uh, you don't know who that is. And some of them might come through and sign up for your email list eventually. But generally, we don't know who buys our books. And um, just uh, talking about Kickstarter again, other crowdfunding uh, I was saying to Orna before we started recording that what is amazing is, is suddenly having ads I can run a Facebook ad and I can actually see whether it converts or not as opposed to just chucking traffic in the direction of a store and somehow trying to figure out whether it, it works so I feel like there are lots of benefits I mean also sites like um, Payhip which used to just be digital and ebooks is now offering print as well um, obviously we both do print through our own stores uh, so people People don't just think it's ebook and audiobook, although shout out to Book Funnel. Uh, Damon at Book Funnel has enabled us all to do easy delivery of ebooks and audiobooks. Um, and then we can do print. Um, so, some of the other ones, I guess we should just mention we both use Patreon, as we've said, um, me for my podcast. Um, what are the other things? Uh, anything else you want to, to mention in terms yeah, of think, tools? I think it's worth talking about nfts um in this context as well because as as time goes on that will become more and more of an opportunity obviously we have some authors who are already taking up that opportunity so that again is a, is a whole different thing that goes with that and i wouldn't advise people to jump in there as a lot of artists for example when it came to doing direct sales nfts were the first thing that they kind of went for i think as authors we have other choices that are that are better but that's certainly certainly worth talking about then you know there's using short form and um, platforms like substack and medium um, and each of these has its own flavor so depending on what you want to achieve so for example people often talk to me about setting up Patreon and it becomes clear that they don't realize that Patreon won't actually get any patrons for you. You, you, you know, it, it does all sorts of things for you, like looks after the taxation thing. And again, this trust sort of thing, if people are familiar with it and all of that, but it's not a um, discovery tool. So you need to sort of be very, very thoughtful and mindful about what you want to achieve and how you're going, you know, it, some of these things take time, obviously everything takes time, and some of these things take more time, certainly it's the setup takes a lot of time. I found moving, I stopped blogging actually in October, so I could have the time and space to think about all this and how I was going to lay it out and make it happen, even though it seems like a very simple thing, move your reader members from Patreon to your website working it all out what i was going to give them how i was going to deliver it, what i wanted to do and didn't want to do how much time things were going to take how much value it would actually bring you know all those kinds of things have to have to be thought about so i would encourage people to set aside time to thinking time and strategizing time before and not leap into something because building building your following on any um, platform, whether it's your own or whether it's, it's um, one of the other ones, it takes time and takes dedication. So you need to build in that time, that time as well. So mm. again, say with Medium and Substack, if you, if you want discoverability, you're probably better going with Substack than Medium. So all of these things have to be taken into consideration. Mm. And then I'd also just add on the mindset. Uh, so someone emailed me just today, actually, and said, uh, but if I tell people to buy off my Shopify store, I won't get ranking on Amazon and I won't be able to hit a bestseller list. And I replied, yes, you are correct. <laughs> And also someone else emailed me and said, uh, if I if I move out of my um, exclusive deal with ACX, 
they tell me I have to withdraw the whole book and republish it again. So I lose all my reviews. So yep. I can't publish wide unless I do that. And again, I had to reply, yes, you are correct. So what happens, as you mentioned, this kind of dark thing and uh, this hidden data, nobody knows how much money I make on creativepenbooks.com except me. And I, yes, you know, exactly. I get more money in my bank account, but that it absolutely does not hit any bestseller list. It does not hit any ranking. It, you know, I now need to get reviews on my store. So there's, a, there, as you said, there's a lot to think about, but it's also a real mindset shift because for the last, what, 15 years of being an independent author, uh, or at least the, the last decade, it's all always been about hitting algorithms, hitting lists. And so this mindset, mindset shift is actually very significant I think it's huge and I think you have to decide what kind of publisher you are we did a show on that just um, before Christmas uh, for engagement publishers and for what we call craft publishers you have to think about approaching this in a completely different way if you're a volume publisher and you're on Amazon and you're hitting bestseller list and that is part of how you make your you know, that's how you make your money, then that's a whole different model. If you're going to go with this model, then you have to change lots of things. And as you say, primarily, you have to change how you think about this, because it's about valuing income and achievement and influence and impact over and above visibility. But mm. it's part of a much bigger trend. It's not that we are never going to have bestseller lists in the way we have them in the past already we don't you know when we mm. read a seller list in the newspaper we know as in the authors we know just how how segmented that list is how removed it is you know from the vast majority of authors who are publishing now it's a tiny tiny segment of of authors who get into that list they have to go generally speaking through unless they're very exceptional in the author who has a very specific strategy they're going to be trade published authors. So it's the same with an Amazon bestseller list. It's a segment. It's very often, um, and depending on your genre, of course, but it's very often KU um, authors who are going to be topping that list. And that is going to see off um, the vast majority of authors. So bestseller lists, of course, by definition, are a tiny group. But what I'm talking about is that they are the bestsellers within a segmented group. So when you go to do this, um, creator economy approach then you are doing something that is completely different you're not trying to be visible in that way in order to earn more you're not trying to please an algorithm you're much more focused on your reader and and on on the product your books and on creative campaigns that are going to take you um, in, a, in a whole different way so it's a completely different thing to set up for example your crowdfunder for your pilgrimage book than it is to put up a KU book on Amazon next week. And <laughs> see, creative marketing in action. <laughs> and for, for people on the audio, <laughs> yeah. I held up my book again. Um, and this is a good tip. I mean, people who are on the video, you can see behind me, I have my books. Orna doesn't, hence, you yeah. know. <laughs> I sometimes only, i never think that sells much books to be honest it doesn't <laughs> matter it looks good yeah it looks great <laughs> yeah, fair um but let's um let's move on i'm wary of time so let's move on to number two which is uh, also a rise so the rise and rise of creative uses for ai tools in writing publishing and book marketing so uh pretty much you know unless you've been living under a rock you've probably heard about some of these ai tools chat gpt went uh, sort of viral before christmas 2022 um text to image things like midjourney dolly stable diffusion and yeah i mean a lot of writers who have resisted it uh, up until now have actually tried. Um, I've been getting emails every day. It's so, what a difference a year makes because, uh, you know, sort of, well, 14 months ago, I was getting a lot of hate mail. And now I get emails that say, oh my goodness, you've changed my life. I'm loving these tools. This is really brilliant. So yeah, it's, it's, it, we're not going to go into the problems and challenges because, of course, there are a lot of them. But I will point people at the um, Ally Ethical and Practical Guidelines for AI Usage. We'll put a link in the notes. I refer to this everywhere. But Orna and I did that, what, about 18 months ago, wasn't it? We put that together. And I'm so glad we did that because it still holds true. It is pretty much everything we said is uh, right on. I mean, could could you have foreseen, could we have foreseen what, what was happening? I guess. I 
think we did in a way, um, we, or we felt it was coming. So I, we went and looked at that post um, in January, actually, straight after Christmas, just feeling we better update this. It's found to be very out of date and found actually it wasn't. So there were a few bits and pieces here and there, but the principles held true. And I think this is the way to to tackle it for now, because as you say, there are, are sort of all sorts of challenges and all sorts of ethical issues, but that's not what we're talking about today. Today we're kind of talking about the um, the opportunities. So yeah, do you want to tell people what you're using so far? Yeah, yeah, some of the things I'm using. So um, one uh, pilgrimage hasn't got much in, but it does have a custom ornamental break of a scallop shell, which I made on mid journey. So that's pretty much the only um, AI thing in pilgrimage. But for uh, my other writing, I'm using PseudoWrite, which is built on GPT-3 as a kind of extended thesaurus for sensory description. It does has a brilliant describe function. Uh, I use mid journey now as I pretty much stopped all my stock photo subscriptions and I now use Midjourney to generate custom images for every blog post, for every um, podcast episode, for character ideation. Um, I've got this short story coming up, which will have an AI a book cover. I use Ch Chat GPT, and this is the biggest thing that people have discovered, I think, is Chat GPT for rewriting and writing sales descriptions, doing book outlines, doing ads. Oh my goodness, for ad copy, it is brilliant. If you put in your book sales description, ask it to rewrite it in a more dramatic way and then ask it to write 10 Facebook ad texts you can do all of that and I mean how many writers love doing that not many um, I also do sort of um, you can interview characters and ask sort of questions of uh, imagine you are a you know an, uh, an, an astronaut in your 50s and then ask them questions um, what else do I do uh, of course pro writing aid Grammarly are AI powered so we're already using that a lot um, AI narrated audiobooks I've done a few of those and Apple has released AI narration now as well as Google and other sites. So that's just, you know, and obviously we all publish on Amazon, Google, Apple, they all use various um, uh, AI engines for that. I mean, if you just use Google search or you use Google Maps, you are already using AI. So that's some of what I'm doing. Um, and someone just asked, okay, when I mentioned chat GPT uh, is the one that um, I was mentioning there, it still has a free tier as we uh, record this, um, which is often oversubscribed, but it's really, really good. So Orna, what about you? What are you using AI for? I have tried most of the tools that you have mentioned there, either, you know, Curiosity as Director of Ally, just checking things out. Uh, the ones that have stuck for me so far, Suderite, just love it. Ch ChatGPT has just changed everything. It's just fantastic. And in personal life as well. And, you know, Philip just heard yesterday he has to, has to do a speech at his niece's wedding. So he just got, <laughs> he got his basic first draft there you know beautifully written and put together and um, I think until you try it you don't I remember the day it came out you you were pinging me I'm so excited try it now I said do it at the weekend try it now and you, you know you were so right I was there as soon as I tried it I was pinging everybody saying try it now so it's really really amazing and um, yeah dream from wamba i don't use mid journey and i stuck with dream and i i really enjoy playing with that i've used it for illustration of poetry and stuff and um yeah i've tried the ai narration didn't love it so it didn't stick with any of that yet um but yeah i i think it's it's um Pseudorite and ChatGPT, in terms of text generation, I think are miles ahead of anybody else and that people are settling in around those. It's like they have become mm. the market leaders already. And as you say, we're bound to have um, a fee slapped on us for ChatGPT very shortly. So anybody who has plans for something they'd like to do, get in there now while, while it is still free. Yeah, although there were kind of rumours that they'll keep a free level because, of course, the data they're harvesting from humans asking questions is incredible. But there is um, they're rolling out a paid version so that it doesn't fail all the time. Because if you yeah. try, like I do it early in the British morning before the Americans are up and I get much, much better speed than in the afternoon when the Americans are all on. But like you said about personal life, I've also had emails from writers who have chronic illness or ha literally only have a certain amount of energy 
to achieve something in a day. And what ChatGPT does is it it's a, it's a lever. These are levers for us as individuals to do more. This is doesn't replace our creativity. It's an enhancement. And what you said about there, you told everyone too, this is why ChatGPT is so amazing, the virality of it. I mean, Jonathan uses it every day too. So when he's at work, he's like, oh, I need to write this email to tell this person I don't want to have a meeting, but I need it to be uh, you know, in a sensitive way. So he'll do a draft, which might sound angry, and then say, rewrite this in a more polite manner. <laughs> Yeah. And it and it will do it. So um, so there are so many ways to use these tools, and that's what we want to encourage people to do: be curious, be open, and be ethical. Read the guidelines. Like to me, the biggest thing is: okay, do not go onto ChatGPT and say uh, write a poem in the style of Orna Ross. Just don't do that because you know it's just that that's not what it's for. Um, use it to do other things, but don't use other people's IP. <laughs> basically. That's that's kind of my rule. On Mid Journey, I don't use an artist's name in my prompts because, you know, who knows otherwise. So I'm just really careful. Um, but yeah, be curious, I guess. That would be my attitude. Any other attitudes, I guess, to, towards this that you've yeah. seen? Yeah, experimental and playful. And remember that they can re rewrite. The deeper you go with them and the more you ask them, the more you feed them and the more you get used to them. And um, the better they get, you know, so it isn't just a matter of, of the first thing that comes out. You ask another question and, and go a little deeper. And there's authors all over the place doing really good guides to how to use these tools for specific aspects of your writing. Say if you're a novelist or, um, you, you know, and you want to do an outline and then you want to develop that outline, you want to develop the setting, you, want, you know, so there are loads and loads of ways in which which you can use these so, and ways that we have yet to discover I'm sure so yeah experiment playful it's fun and don't worry too much about there's a lot of negativity um around the tools but these tools are going to win through and a lot of the concerns around copyright and so on if you read what's happening in the cases and if you actually engage with the copyright issues you'll see that they are being misrepresented all over the place so don't mm. take your information on ai from social media if you care about the ethics of it and um, as joanna said you can you can pop on to our ethical posts and there are practical guidelines there for, for usage as well but you can you know go into it deeply but don't take a lot of the hate stuff that's going around because it's actually fear it's fear of technology mm -hmm. it's it's sort of Ludditism. so um yeah those the cases are going to make the law a lot clearer um but mm -hmm. at the end of the day our copyright as we have known it is now something that's not going to apply in the same way as it has applied in the past what exactly that means We'll know more in, in, in a few years to come, but we, um, in meantime, don't get left out just because you feel, mm. oh, this is dangerous. Yeah. And in fact, on my last show on the Creative Pen podcast or two shows ago, I did a, like 30 minutes going through the three court cases right now. Um, and I've got a, a copyright lawyer coming on soon to talk about these things. So, yeah, um, keep learning. And if you feel resistance, then really look at why you feel resistance and um, yeah, dive in anyway. You don't have to publish anything that you try. You can just keep it keep it private. So um, but you mentioned social media there. So we should move on to our number three three for um, what we're wondering what the hell is going on with, which is the fragmentation and shifting of social media. So everyone will probably know that something happened with Twitter in the last quarter of 2022, which is, you know, Elon Musk bought Twitter and proceeded to, to do all kinds of things that made a lot of people angry and leave the platform. Uh, some people have gone to Mastodon, to Hive, to LinkedIn, uh, have left social media altogether. Uh, I'm still on Twitter. I'm I'm Twitter for the long term. Um, I'm going down with that particular ship. Um, but I have found that my usage has changed because the algorithms have changed and I am actually leaning crazily more on Facebook, which is really odd. Um, but um, Orna, what, what do, what's your thought around Twitter? Because we've both done different things here, haven't we? Yeah, I left Twitter um, and that was huge for me because it was my favorite platform. It was my favorite, favorite social medium, but I did leave it because of what was, and what was going on. But also I felt 
that um, it was getting a little tired for me and mm -hmm. it was quite a big decision um, at the time and I have regretted it once or twice to be honest mm -hmm. I've gone to tweet something and haven't been able to <laughs> and there are certain things that only fit on Twitter that don't fit on Facebook and don't fit on I, you know I use them in specific sorts of ways so but overall I'm pleased and uh, I'm pleased because it rationalized my social media I, mm. I you know I was somebody who kind of did a bit of everything and in this move that I made it in the last quarter of last year it was very much about dropping things and the thing about being an indie author is that you're you know it's very easy to drop things you don't like it's dropping the things that you do like and mm -hmm. that you do enjoy and um, is the real challenge. So I think it's a measure of, you know, how how much you're doing right is how much you you like what you have to let go. And uh, so I'm I'm happy that it, that it went. I'm focusing on Facebook for fiction and Instagram for poetry. Mm -hmm. And I find that the way in which all of them are operating has shifted hugely with the whole idea of social selling, with the idea of the creator economy. They, Meta has very much embraced it, seen how um, YouTube was doing for, you know, YouTube takes the lion's share of the creator economy and has done all the way through, but they are now copying that model, essentially the advertising model. Um, and so it has changed how they do things. And it's good for us as, as authors. We can't know for sure what they're up to most of the time, but observing what, what's going on, I think is, is definitely worth doing and try to move with the trend. So of course, the other big trend that we saw in publishing last year was book talk, um, which really did seem to make a significant difference and um, I think for the early adopters who went in there and, and got stuck in they really saw uh, for the first time in ages I think where a direct organic social media was sending books up the charts it, signs are that that's kind of easing off now as more people come onto the platform it's the typical sort of trajectory mm. that every platform goes through but um, video as book promotion has definitely gone up hugely across the board and that doesn't necessarily mean doing you know what we're doing now um, a live talk or anything but it can be book trailers or whatever those little smart and and shorts short short video that is a big opportunity I think in terms of getting your message across if you can master short video and um, there's significant evidence that readers like it and it does make them buy Mm. Yeah, so a few things on that. So you mentioned social selling, so we should just explain. So basically, when Orna puts a poem on Instagram, she can then link to a book on the store, which essentially goes through to her website to order a book. So it used to be that our whole thing around social media was, oh, you put, put a picture on Instagram, someone eventually follows you, uh, they might click on your bio, and then they might go to a store, and then they might buy a book. So there were steps between someone seeing a social media post and actually buying a book. But with social selling, these platforms, essentially, you can have a almost like a buy button within the post. So that's what we mean by social selling. You also mentioned TikTok and the, the typical trajectory of a social media platform, which is we and then early adopters do really well and then everyone else jumps in. And But what's different with TikTok is how fast it's happening. I mean, the trajectory is just huge. And I actually, um, we mentioned this back in uh, the autumn, but I went to a Wired Smarter Day and the TikTok people spoke and they were already moving into TikTok shop. So the trajectory of moving into sales, of moving into their own ecosystem was really, really fast. But as we've seen with other platforms like YouTube, um, many of the creators start to burn out because they're creating so much content. So again, it's trying to be quite relaxed about things, take a step back. Everything we're talking about is an opportunity, uh, people listening. It is an opportunity to try something new, but also an opportunity to stop doing something like Orna stopped doing Twitter. And I'm, I guess I'm revisiting Facebook and Instagram because now I can measure things better because of my store. So 
Uh, I still don't do TikTok. I'm not interested in that. But I am interested in what is coming this year also with AI, which is uh, text to video, generative video. So I don't like doing video because of all the, you know, putting makeup on and being on camera. But um, if I can do video more easily in the same way I use ChatGPT to generate ads, then yes, I'm going to do that. So again, it's keeping an eye out for things that you think uh, you could use. But again, it's also about how much things are changing because some people are saying, oh, social media is dead. Now, I don't think social media is dead, but it's certainly changing and it's not the way it used to be. So what I would suggest to people is don't just keep doing the same thing year after year. Think, how could I do things differently? How could I change it up both for um, the, the benefit of business, but also your creative energy? Because marketing should be creative, right? That's what we're talking about. Absolutely. Um, I think it's also worth, you know, I agree with you that social media is not dead because social media is just people talking uh, to each other and that's not going to die and uh, it will take different forms though and staying staying close to those trends and ideas I, I think is important the other thing that's not dead is very much um, something that hasn't changed at all <laughs> since we started is email marketing it it is still the core um, and you know social all, all sorts of things lead to email marketing and the creator economy that we're talking about completely relies on email marketing so if you haven't got your email autoresponders and sign up forms and um, newsletters and stuff sorted as that is probably after you're writing your top priority for right mm. now and it's something that remains an opportunity is a way in which is, you know, you've got to understand your reader. You've got to understand you can get better and better at it all the time. Platforms also that supply, you know, email marketing services like ConvertKit and MailerLite, they are getting into providing products mm -hmm. that you can sell as well. So they are, it's like everything is converging around this idea that the creator is at the heart of things and as indies that puts us in a very good place to capitalize on opportunities I think. Yes and as ever we are still very excited about the way ahead <laughs> I mean we've both been doing this for a long time now and we always say you know I think we were a bit tired about 18 months ago we talked about maybe shutting this down and both of us were feeling like oh not much is happening we don't have much to talk about and then it was like everything took off again and now it feels like oh my goodness like the roaring 20s are actually starting to happen um the ai take off you know the creator economy take off it feels as exciting to me as sort of 2008 2009 when ebooks arrived and digital publishing and and uh, digital audiobooks and i mean many people might not remember that time but it was so exciting and it was kind of the wild west and you could jump in and you could do new things and that's kind of how i feel about it now the opportunities are just it, it never stops right Orna it, there are no shortage of opportunities absolutely none and uh, any of them can be picked up of course developing the ability to to actually capitalize on those opportunities is a different thing and that takes as we were saying earlier on it takes time it takes planning it takes uh, in, engagement and experimentation and being playful and being willing to go there and not being afraid to drastically change mm -hmm. you know maybe the best thing if things aren't happening for you definitely change something and um if you know if they aren't happening you've nothing to lose by trying something really really different um so yeah i think absolutely exciting times there and huge opportunities there for authors who are willing to do to do the work it's hard work, but it's definitely worth it now in a way that it has never been before. Yeah. Independence for the win. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Uh, so there you go there's your pep talk everyone uh, so we next month we will be back and we will be talking about how to make more money than the average author because there have been some really miserable surveys saying that authors just make so little money and we want to talk about how you can pull certain levers to make more money and uh, essentially give you lots of ideas um, but you know I guess quite a hardcore episode on a whole load of things you can do so you're above average <laughs> preferably 
preferably well above average if you are interested in making money as a writer, which of course not everyone is. So um, that's what we'll be talking about next month. Orna, is there anything that uh, anything else you want to talk about? Um, Friday is the uh, Publishing for Profit um, workshop. So those of you who I know Michelle is here and I know Vicky is here and some other people who, who are there, um, we are going to be doing a 10 weeks to turn things around. So if you want to know more about that, uh, selfpublishingadvice.org forward slash workshop. Yeah, that's it, I think. Brilliant. This month. Yeah, well, in the meantime, happy writing. And happy publishing. Bye-bye. Bye. Yes. You okay? We're still live. <laughs> Are we? <laughs> it still says we're live. <laughs> <laughs>